Good afternoon. We are very pleased to welcome you to this uh, session, which is dedicated to catheter-based treatment revolution with new uh, innovative devices for uh, valvular disease. My name is Elena Elchaninov, and uh, I'm very pleased to um, co-moderate co this session with uh, Stefan Windecker and uh, Philippe Lourdes. And we have a great panel of uh, expert uh, international cal cardiologists and imaging uh, uh, physicians to discuss about these uh, uh, subjects. So this is the agenda of the session, which is a 90 minutes uh, session. First part will be uh, dedicated to the TAVI story and in particular the new uh, TAVI device named Sapien X4. We'll have uh, the scientific data and the recorded case. And the second part will be uh, dedicated to tricuspid regurgitation with the new uh, EVOC device, again with the presentation of the trace and two results and the recorded uh, case. So we have a learning objective is to learn about these latest innovations related to uh, TAVI and tricuspid uh, regurgitation to understand how the latest evidence innovations are changing the therapy for our patients and to discuss, of course, the benefits of these new uh, solutions for patients with valvular disease. So I also want to welcome you on behalf of Helen and uh, Philipp Lutz. It's our pleasure to moderate uh, this uh, session uh, this evening. And I think it's no secret that uh, valvular heart disease is one of the most innovative fields in cardiovascular medicine at large. If you just think back two decades ago, uh, there was not a single randomized uh, clinical trial. And in the meantime, we have a plethora of evidence in a field that has been devoid of evidence-based uh, medicine. Now, transcatheter aortic valve implantation is certainly one of uh, the biggest advances and a big paradigm shift in the way we treat uh, patients today. And you wonder whether we have uh, uh, reached a threshold where we cannot improve uh, further. And in this context, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Michael Jona, who will be uh, give the first presentation and give us in some insights in continuous efforts uh, to innovate uh, the TAVI space. Michael? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, um, I'm thrilled and privileged at the same time to be presenting next to all these great minds who have seen TAVI from the early beginnings. This is my conflict of interest. Now, it has been a journey of over 15 years uh, with four generations of sapien valves, and you can see starting all the way from the original sapien transcatheter heart valve that was investigated in the Partner 1 trial, all the way to the Partner 3 trial, the most contemporary sapien 3 ultra that is also approved for low-risk patients. Now, unfortunately, we understand that these heart valves don't last forever, and as we are moving and embarking to an area of treating younger and lower-risk patients, Tissue valve durability and reducing the need for re-intervention may be paramount in these patients. So when we look at data from the Partner 2 valve and valve registry, you can see that um, recurrent stenosis is the most common cause of failure in these patients. And when you look at the underlying pathology on the right panel of this slide, you can see that tissue calcification is underlying in these cases. Now, is there anything we can do about this? And there is a um, tissue engineering technology entitled Resilia that has been developed over almost 20 years now. And you can see most recent data from the COMMENCE trial, a prospective multicenter single-arm IDE study that looked at freedom of structural valve deterioration after seven years. And you can see this was 99.3%. Now, this technology is now consequently been taken over to transcatheter heart valves. It entails a two-step process, which is called the integrity preservation technology. And what it does, it, it performs a stable capping of free aldehydes. We know aldehydes are largely involved in tissue calcification. And in a second step is, comes the glycerolization, which takes out all the water, enables dry storage, and further prevents exposure to aldehydes. Now, I've already talked about the fact that this has been used already in surgical heart valves, the Inspiris and Mitris, and it's been taken over to the Sapien 3 Ultra Resilia. And more important, and this is what it's all about today, the next generation Sapien X4 transcatheter heart valve. You all know that the 
term of lifetime management is very important, and we've been discussing this throughout recent meetings. I want to just point out to four important facts, which I personally believe are extremely important. We need to be able to optimize the index procedure, as such have reproducible results, safe results, good outcomes, a personalized valve sizing, and good solution for paravalvular leak. We also understand now that we need to extend valve longevity. Novel tissue technology may be needed in this regard. Coronary excess is so important because this is the most frequent overlapping disease condition. And we know that we need to achieve commissural alignment these days. And finally, in the last step, we need to plan for THV and THV procedures um, with control of valve orientation relative to the patient-specific anatomy. And all of this was taken to the Sapien X4 transcatheter heart valve system. You see that it utilizes resilient tissue. Again, I've already talked about the enhanced anti-calcification technology. And also, it has an enhanced PAT outer skirt designed to further minimize PVL and maintain its low profile excess. It has a novel frame and leaflet design, uh, which enables adjustable sizing. We'll talk about this in a moment. And it has very low frame height and large cells to facilitate future coronary access. And now this is the cool part of this valve. <laughs> the Sapien X4 comes in three valve sizes with 16 unique deployment diameters at 0.5 millimeter increments. That means that you can personalize and adjust to the individual need of the patient such as, for example, the 23 millimeter valve can be expanded from 21.5 to 23.5. In a very similar fashion, you can see this for the 26 and the 29 millimeter valves. It is delivered through a novel, very flexible delivery system, leveraging a commander technology, which you know. It is able to perform on-balloon valve preparation to enable commissural alignment. It still utilizes the 14 and 16 French ECs technology. And importantly, it has a valve rotation control, which can be used to enable commissural alignment. And you will see this in the next slide. This is a short clip demonstrating once you've achieved the standard three-cast view, you can use then the valve control, the rotation control, to align the C marker to the center front, as you can see it here, which then tells you, and this is illustrated in the short cartoon, that you have achieved very safely um, commissural alignment um, for the individual patient anatomy. Now, this trial has been investigated in a series of alliance trials that are ongoing, covering both symptomatic severe native aortic stenosis as well as failing aortic bioprosthetic valves. The primary endpoint for both studies is non-hierarchical and composite of death and stroke at one year, and it co covers all well-known proportions of anatomists, such as trileaflet, of course, but also bicuspid and in the valve and valve, you can see it covers both failed surgical as well as transcatheter heart valves. The national PIs are listed below, and it has follow-up annually up to 10 years. That brings me to the conclusion the partner trial series has demonstrated excellent outcomes for the patients. Lifetime management is the most significant consideration for future valve design. You've seen that novel resilient tissue demonstrates low rates of structural valve deterioration out to seven years and will be incorporated into next generation balloon expandable TAVI. And the Sapien X4 valve seeks to optimize safe reproducible index procedure. It really focuses on lifetime management and is currently investigated in the series of alliance trials. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you, Michael. Uh, you can uh, uh, stay with us uh, for, for a discussion because uh, we will not proceed immediately to the next case. But thank you for summarizing the new features, which are basically the anti-calcification uh, treatment, the adaptive uh, valve uh, uh, sizing, and the commissural alignment. Um, maybe we can start the discussion uh, regarding the anti-calcification uh, uh, treatment. Is this now this resilient technology you uh, apply to any patient? or do you make a certain patient uh, selection that are predisposed to an accelerated uh, degeneration process? How would you envision to apply this uh, as yeah. an all-comer to everybody or selective? Well, um, let's start with the fact that this has been an ongoing technology development for almost 20 years, and we know that tissue calcification plays such a dominant role. Um, and that is something that is unique for all kinds of bioprosthetic valves. So I think when we are able to get rid of this calcification, 
we should use it for all the cases. Of course, then we have you know, other aspects such as costs involved, etc. cetera. Um, but I think once we you know, have a good technology that is available, we should use it for every patient. Um, maybe I'm turning to uh, Raj. Uh, you have already practical experience within the Alliance uh, uh, program. Uh, so tell us a little bit how, uh, what are the differentiating features as compared to what we currently routinely use? So, you know, as Mike mentioned, you get to get Resilia technology when you're using X4. So I think that's great. The fact that the frame is a little bit different, right? So in fact, as you are... Uh, taking this frame to different sizes, you will not have pinwheeling. So that's the entire idea, so that you can actually expand the valve to different sizes and still maintain the leaflet function optimally. So that's the other important thing. And then finally, you know, the, the fact that you can align this commissurally is, is a big, big advantage. And I think in terms of doing the procedure, it's fairly simple. I think the, uh, you know, it, the same French size, of course. You don't have to assemble the valve because it's already assembled. So you don't have to do that by pulling the balloon in, you know, in the uh, aorta. Uh, and I have to say that, you know, from an operational point of view, I don't think once you just learn this a little bit, there's not a whole lot to do. Uh, and the ability you have to know to get the three cusp view, and then you can actually really align it very well. And we've done some TE cases, and then we've done some post-procedure CTs, and I think it seems to work fairly well. So many things uh, that we further can uh, improve. Perhaps uh, turning back to the durability issue, you are performing studies now in this alliance for tricuspid aortic stenosis. You also look at bicuspid aortic stenosis. What do you think is the appropriate way for us to evaluate durability long term? There's no way we can wait for 15 years to show that this is more durable than the predecessor. So what, what, what should be our informed approach uh, to investigate this rationally? Uh, I think it would be very attractive to do a study in young patients Right, and we are all um, attracted to the concept of doing a study in bicuspid. So that would be a dream come true, you know, if you could do this in younger patients and actually establish the durability over a longer period of time. Uh, we ha you have a, there is a new skirt on this X4. Does it have an impact on the size of the of the sheath? So um, and the cover also. Of the, yes. Of the so I think um, so, Ellen. Uh, I think one of the things we do do is, when we use this daily, is there is a dilator that is provided with the sheath. So you will actually insert this, which facilitates the insertion of uh, you know, the valve system through the sheath. So that's, that's one. And I think, you know, once again, there is no systematic data, but it does seem to, you know, when you're doing these cases on a day-to-day -day basis, it seems like that even the mild PV leak might be a little bit lower, you know, with this new skirt. But I think I have to make a disclaimer, we need to do proper assessment for that. Do you need a some degree of oversizing or do you prefer to keep like an almost nominal? So I think that's very, and I think these are the discussions because these cases are presented on a case call, we present and then we actually, um, you know, go through the sizing. And it is very common for us to deploy this with 2% or 4% oversizing rather than with 10 or 15% oversizing. So, so I think less degree of oversizing is something that is what we tend to use uh, right now in the Alliance trial. Uh, maybe back to you, um, Michael, regarding the commissural alignment. Um, I think uh, we know it's a limitation with self-expanding valves. We are not so used to, to think yeah. about it with uh, balloon expandable yeah. uh, valves. Um, can you elaborate a little bit where you see the relevance and the advantages? Yeah, again, we're coming back to the um, topic of lifetime management. Um, the Eventually, this may not be the only valve that is implanted in a patient, and I think that's when commissural alignment matters. Because if you then want to explant a second valve, actually, um, you may still be below the coronary takeoff, and it may be easy to engage. But I think 
Um, still then, you don't know which valve you will be implanting, and it helps to have commissural alignment with the first valve already. Second is, I think we have seen recent data, mostly coming from self-expanding valves, that also hemodynamic factors are different when you implant them with commissural alignment. So durability may be impacted by commissural alignment. We don't know for sure these days, but I think this is what we have to learn and then uh, engage into this. I think we can move to the... Thank you very much. We'll move on. So, as I said, we'll have a recorded case of this uh, X4 uh, device, and we, uh, John Webb will present the, the patient. So, I can't really speak in two places at one time, so we'll, we'll start the video, and I think the video will speak for itself. <laughs> Hopefully. So, good morning um, from Vancouver. And uh, Holly, do you want to go ahead and tell us the story? Okay, thanks, John. Um, so, next slide, please. Here we have a 78 year old gentleman with um, severe aortic stenosis and normal LV systolic function. He's been having worsening symptoms of shortness of breath on exertion in keeping with NYHA class 2. His echocardiogram showed a normal LV systolic function with an EF of 65% aortic valve area of 0 0.9 and his mean gradient is 57 millimeter per mercury. Next slide. His pre-TAVI uh, CT scan showed an annular area of 455 and a mean diameter of 24. Regarding adverse root features, there is no LVOT or annular calcification and uh, his coronary heights look reasonable with no major uh, or high risk for coronary obstruction. He has no obstructive uh, CAD on the CT scan. Next slide, please. With regard to axis, um, there is mild to moderate calcification bilaterally, which uh, could be a concern, but uh, axis seems to be feasible otherwise with good uh, minimal lumen diameters. The minimal lumen diameter is eight millimeter in our case. Next slide. We could take a 23 millimeter and uh, we could deploy it at the maximum diameter 23.5 and that would be 5% undersizing, which we might want to do in some patients with a very calcified annulus or, and so on or something like that. Or we can take a 26 millimeter valve and we could deploy it to 25 millimeters diameter, which would be 8% oversized. But what we're going to do is we're going to take the 26 millimeter, we're going to deploy it to 24.5 millimeters diameter. Um, we don't need to think about the volume, underfilling, overfilling. We're just going to pick that diameter, to deploy it to 24.5. The nominal area will be 471. And remember, the CT said 455 was the area. Uh, and then that would be 3% oversizing. And the beauty of this is that if we do have a leak, we can then redilate it to 25. It would be 8% oversized. It's very easy to, to manage it this way. So next slide, please. Here's what we're planning. Of course, a 78-year-old man, severe symptomatic uric stenosis, normal LV function, who decided to do transfermal TAVI. Obviously, that's why we're here. And he's in the Alliance trial. So the access, right common femoral uh, for primary access. We're going to do LV pacing because he has no conduction disturbances. And there's a fairly low risk of heart block after this procedure with Sapien X4 valve. We're going to take the 26 millimeter a Sapien X4 valve. We're going to deploy it to 24.5 millimeters diameter. That'll be 3% oversized, which is kind of in the optimal range, but we can go quite a bit bigger if we need to if there's a leak. And uh, uh, we're going to aim for commissural alignment. So I'll show you how we do that in a few minutes. So, so just a couple of things. First of all, this isn't really just a Sapien 3 valve where we fill it underfilled or overfilled. This is a different valve. And the leaflets are constructed slightly different than these, the frames, so, so it's that it's much more compliant in terms of dealing with um, various levels of expansion. We used to worry about with the Sapien 3 about getting central leaks or, or, or getting uh, leaflets uh, coming in contact with the stent frame. This is designed to be uh, inflated over a range of volumes. You won't decide that. You'll de decide the diameter you want and pick that. And we, we have good data showing that the optimal sizing is something like 0% to 10% oversizing, and that it's very acceptable to undersize by up to 5%. We commonly do that in calcified annuli, is underfill, sorry, undersize by 5%. And we could do that here, but because we have this, this to choice of two valves, and we can start with a big valve smaller or the small valve bigger, we can decide which way we might want to go. We, we're maybe going to want to 
make this 24.5 valve a 25 if there's a bit of a leak? Do we want to make it even bigger and have it shorten below the corner a little bit? Well, there's a lot of options uh, now. So first of all, thanks for sharing your initial experience, which uh, obviously we will uh, benefit from. But maybe explain a little bit in more detail how uh, this stepwise uh, inflation actually occurs. I assume you use the same balloon. You just well, fill I, up. I think the natural inclination. Yes, it's the same. It's the same balloon. The inflation device has an attachment, and you basically fill the inflation on the tat tat device up to the millimeter diameter you want. It's going to say in this case, 24, 24.5. 25.5, 26. I'll show you the inflation device in the video, and you'll see it's very, very, very clearly. It's a different way of doing it, but a lot of commonality. I'd also say the skirt doesn't uh, contribute to the diameter of this. It's, it's, in fact, the mounted balloon passes very easily through the sheath, particularly with the sheath expansion tool I'll show you as well. And in your experience so far, uh, how frequently do you succeed with just one inflation? So here's the thing, is that we thought, well, we'll start in putting in the valve a little small and then we make it bigger. But we almost never want to because the ceiling is almost always good enough. In fact, you know, we may accept very mild leaks that we would otherwise treat um, by, have, by putting in a bigger valve. So we'll see whether leaks really decrease because people are going to put in smaller valves and be happy with them, I think. Okay. I think uh, we are ready to move to okay. the actual uh, case. Huh? So here's the actual case. So good morning from Vancouver, John Webb here. Uh, we're going to be doing a Sapien X4 uh, transcatheter valve implant today. So those of you who aren't familiar with this, this is the next generation of Sapien valve after the Sapien 3 Ultra Resilia. So we always do this with ultrasound uh, and Ali's going to be very careful. Now he put in you know, maybe 5 to 10 cc's depending on how uh, heavy the patient is. Then he's going to do his puncture and then we're going to put some more local in along the actual sheath size. So here's his puncture. He's going to go down and hopefully indent the artery right in the center to optimize closure later on. It's very nice. Indenting the artery nicely and then we're going to get flashback and uh, put the wire in and here we go. So we have um, a uh, seven French sheath in. We have two proglides. On the other side here, can you see this over here? We actually have a, a sheath wire just placed inside the venous sheath. Uh, there's a little clip on it and a little bit of a kink so it can't slip inside. That's the pole for our, our uh, LV wire pacing. It works very nicely. I think better than just a needle. Uh, we're very impressed with that. And then we just have the standard E sheath at this point in time. So I'm going to take this out and we'll see how the sheath works. And there's a couple little changes here. Let's wipe the wire. Okay. So we take the e-sheath and we just plug the hole and if you could move the table, I can see the end of this, we'll just watch this go up on, this is an Amplatz extra stiff wire, it's moderately stiff, uh, show me the tip of the sheath, tip of the sheath, just follow me up, follow me up, follow me up, there we are, follow me up, okay that's pretty good, we'll just stop here, a little bit hanging out there, we'll take the dilator out, we'll leave this wire up for now, this is the uh, in-sheath dilator and it has some raised segments here and the idea of this is just to push it through the sheath to actually pre-stretch the expandable sheath. So I'm just going to put that in over the wire and this sheath is not, this dilator is not long enough to go out the end so I don't have to watch this under floral. What I've done now is just pre-stretch the expandable sheath and then we're going to take this out and I think we'll just take all of this out. There you go. So there, the wire, the sheath is ready to go. And we're going to, sh going to uh, just give it a flush. And Ali, maybe I'll get you to show, sew that in. Okay. So we can go ahead and open the valve. So this is the Sapien X4 valve. It's with the uh, dry, dry technology, so it's not in glued or aldehyde. Aldehydes are involved in calcification, of course. Just going to flush that with the uh, saline. So you've got the 
a fabric cuff around the exterior, no internal cuff. We've got bovine pericardial valves with the Resilia tissue preservation, which is ideal if you're needing a durable valve. Uh, it's on the new uh, Edwards and Spurs um, aortic surgical valve as well currently. And the Sapien 3 ultra resilious valve as well, which is available in the U.S. And there's the cobalt chromium frame with these large cells which are uniform from top to bottom, allow good coronary access. So that's the Sapien X4 valve. So here's the inflation device. It's a little different than previously. The, um, the side ports, uh, on, actually on the side, which is like the 29 uh, inflation device with the Sapien 3, but they're all like this, so that you can actually hold them on the table if you want to without compressing the tube. And here you can see you can actually, th this is going to be uh, supplied to you, uh, filled to a predetermined diameter. So we decided we were going to deploy this to 24.5. Is that correct? Yeah, so 24.5. The plunger would be right at that point. If we fill a little bit more, we could go to 25, 25.5, 26, 26.5 millimeters diameter. So that's the inflation device. So this is the Sapien X4 delivery system. Uh, we've got the loader here. The valve is preloaded on the balloon. So this is a non-balloon system. There's no alignment required once it's inside. We've got the fabric seal towards the LV. The open cells towards the aorta flow from LV to aorta. It looks very nice, no problem there. And if we look at the back end, it's very similar to the commander system with the Sapien 3 valve. The difference is primarily back here. So if we go back here, we'll see that there's a uh, rotation control um, a handle here. And this allows us to rotate the whole balloon and valve so as to get commissural alignment. So that this would uh, uh, align on the front with the the uh, a right cusp and on the back with the commissure. Uh, this will help us know which way to steer the valve for proper alignment. I'll show that to you when we're actually in the patient. Okay, so we'll just do a valve pause. The uh, cuff in the LV, open cells in the order flow LV to aorta, looks good. Check the wire on the fluoro, it looks nice. Go ahead and put this in. And with having pre-stretched the sheath, it should be fairly easy to advance this could you show me the end of the sheet, please? And the end of the wire in the LV. And they were actually already in the expanded portion, so it's fairly easy to go through the sheath without undue force. And we'll just go right up to the abdominal aorta. And this is where I would normally pause uh, to do my alignment, but I don't have to. So just looking at this, we'll just cine this so people can see it. There we've got the, um, just in the lights, we see a little better over there. We've got the uh, valve between the two valve markers, and we have the positioning marker it, towards the middle. It's no longer a middle marker. It's a little eccentric, but, but perfect for alignment later on. And that looks good. We're ready to go. Yeah. It's a bit of a letdown, huh? No, no alignment. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, uh, so now you'll follow me as I go up? Yeah. It's going to rotate it so the handle's on the outside. And you can see the C marker there we're going to use for alignment. I'm just going to add a little bit of flexion to make this gentler. I'm going to retract the wire so that it's really only the nose cone that's contacting the aortic wall. Reduces the risk of embolization, I think. And we're going to go right down to just above the valve. So let's go to the uh, implant view, please. Three cusp view for this valve. Okay, so now we're going to have a look. We're at the implant view. We have the device just above the leaflets. The pigtail's nice. Do you want to give me a little test there? Sure. Okay. So we have a reasonable wire position. It's not ideal, but I think it's fine. And uh, there, that's a little better. The pump's ready and full. You're going to do the inflation. Yeah. You're going to do the tests. Yes. We have the pacer hooked up. Pressure's nice. Pump is set 10 for 15. So if we look at this, we can see that the C marker is off to the side a little bit. I'm just going to rotate this a little bit, unlock it, and rotate it so that the C appears like a C right superimposed upon the wire. We don't have to be too exact with this at this time because, of course, when we cross the valve, it'll change a little bit. So I'll just make sure it's in the region of being nicely positioned. Okay, there we are. So we're all ready? Ready on the pacer? 
Yeah, it'll be a minute. So I'm going to cross the valve now. Now, the gradient's 57, but we didn't really think we need to pre-dilate anyway, so we haven't. I think that's about where we want to be. So I'm going to unlock the valve. I'm going to bring the flex gap back. I'm going to lock it again. Can I give you have a little test here? Yes, buff. Pigtail We're going to advance a little bit. The pigtails come up. We're going to re-advance the pigtail. Yeah, looks good. Test again. That's pretty good. So this is maybe just a little bit low. I'm going to bring it up a little bit. And it looks like the C marker is almost exactly where we want it. Not quite, though, so I'm just going to rotate it a little bit backwards. And I think that's pretty nice. Do a test there for me. Test. I'm going to go a little deeper. Test again. Okay, ready with the pacer? Pacer on. Inject. Inject. Go up. Balloon up. All the way. All the way. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, balloon down. Pacer off. We'll just pull the pigtail back. There we are. So I think that's looking pretty good. Just replay that for a second. So if you look at that, we've got the marker just about mid-annular plane. We're hoping to stay below the left coronary artery because this patient uh, is young enough that he might need a redo procedure at some time. It looked like it opened up fairly nicely. The C marker is nicely centered on the wire. I think we did a good job with that. Looks like a very, very good deployment. We'll move the pigtail back down. I think we'll do an aorogram here and just think about whether this is good enough because we can always make this bigger there. We're actually very nicely aligned. I don't think we need to change anything very much. Ready for an aortogram? Yes, John Aaron. Inject. And there you can see, very nice positioning. The... Um, the uh, valve is positioned below the left coronary artery, so this is a very repeatable procedure. No problems with coronary angioplasty in future or, or a second TAVI valve if he needs, should he needs one. I really don't see any paravalvular leak there, even though we have, still have the wire across the valve. I think if we um, want to move the camera cranial for a moment, you'll see that the middle marker is on the back. So let's just cine. We're going to move back. There, you see, it's on the back. So that's nice commissural alignment. It's perfect, I think. Let's take this system out. Just leave the wire in the descending aorta. Okay. So there's the left neosinus with the two markers uh, superimposed. So what we've done here is we've aligned the two commissural markers uh, either side of the left cusp, almost one on top of the other. Very nice. Okay, so we'll get echo in. So do you see any paravalvular leak? No, I think there's a bit from the mitral valve there, but no, I don't see anything. So no paravalvular leak on shorter long axis. And do we have a gradient? Looks good. So mean gradient. Five. Five. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. So let's see, your your vow was just about an hour and a half ago or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Did you have a fun time? I actually, I am shocked how, e how, uh, how easily it went. Yeah. It was... Uh, it was amazing. It was oh. absolutely amazing. Oh, that's great. We thought it, we were very happy how it went. Yeah. We've got a perfect result. There's no leak. Oh. Gradient's good. No problems at all. Oh, no need amazing. for a pacemaker. So I'll get you up in a couple hours and okay. you'll, you'll skedaddle home tomorrow. Okay, wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> that's great. Thank you so we'll much. We'll see you. See you a little later. All great. Right. Okay. Bye-bye now. Thanks.
Thank you, uh, John, for sharing this very educative uh, case. And I take there are several enhancements. Uh, you, by, even if it's little ones, the predilation of uh, the sheath. Maybe we can comment on this. The dry technology. You just take it out of uh, of the box. Uh, then that the valve is preloaded. Um, but I know that you still have a pusher. We can comment on this uh, for a moment. Um, then the adaptive uh, valve sizing. We already commented a little bit, but maybe we can start the discussion on this commissure. Uh, alignment. You very elegantly showed how it actually works. And maybe you, you can share with us how successful you are in uh, individual cases beyond the one, the best case you probably have shown to us in, in uh, real practice in how you assess it. Um, do you do uh, systematic echocardiography? Are you satisfied with the fluoroscopic uh, identification so, of the markers? So, or do you so do first of all, it's important for this particular, you can modify the technique to use cusp overlap views, but this is set up for the three cusp view. So you need a perfect three cusp view. So we determine this from CT. For that matter, we also determine a perfect left coronary view, which we sometimes use as well. But for the three cusp view, you have the right cusp in front of you. So you want the commissure BT directly posterior to that. And that's the case when you see that little marker look like a C. And you, overlap, you just overlap it with the wire, and then you know that the posterior commissural attachment is going to be right on the back, right posterior to the right cusp, and then everything lines up automatically. It's really very, very easy to do. You know, uh, I think that uh, there's a little bit of a learning curve in terms of how to mount this that the company has gone through, uh, and uh, uh, how best to you know, rotate it and line up the C with the wire. Uh, generally, it's been pretty reproducible. I mean, you can assess this quite well on CT afterwards less well on echo, but even on fluoroscopy, I think you can make a good assessment. If as you fluoro up, you see the middle marker move to the back, you know it's on the back adjacent to the cusp. And uh, if you wish to line up the two cusps either side of the left main coronary artery, and then look at the left main, you can see that very nicely as well. So you can assess this pretty well immediately at the time of the procedure, or, or better yet, CT later. Uh, on the same subject, uh, I was um, interested to see that uh, even without commissural alignment, you were below the left main and the catheter engaged very easily. So is it this commissural alignment for balloon expandable mostly important for a redo so, procedure so in the I, future? I think if you're dealing with this infracoronary valve, commissural alignment doesn't matter that much for future procedures. We won't be doing basilicas on this particular patient anyway, he won't need one. But if you implanted your sapien valve high, then this might be an yes. issue. I think there are other issues though. One of them is there may be better uh, uh, washout with coronary alignment and there may be less HALT. And HALT may have something to do with stroke. This is a bit speculative. It may have something to do with durability. Maybe less speculative that HALT has something to do with that. So I think there'll be less of this with commissural alignment. It's, it's all a bit speculative, isn't it? And, but certainly if you're doing a super coronary implant, Commissure alignment is probably really important for repeatability. Most of the time, this valve will be infraquarry, so maybe less important. And if, for instance, if you're, if you're not successful in commissure alignment, as long as the valve is below the coronary, well, mm, it's a repeatable you. procedure anyway. Mm. I agree. Tell us a little bit about the frame and uh, the implantation height. Uh, you made the remark uh, that the middle marker should be on, on the annulus. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I, we have to stop calling it a middle marker because it used to be in the middle, now it's a little lower. Mm -hmm. And it's designed to be put on the annulus, the marker itself. So I would call it a positioning marker. And uh, it seems to work extremely well. Take the positioning marker and put it on the plane of the annulus, a little above, a little below, whatever you think, depending on pacemaker risk versus coronary obstruction risk. Um, but it, it's, it's very handy, uh, the positioning marker. I think people will just use that with a comfort level. And uh, today uh, we, will learned, uh, we heard a lot of, uh, about cusp overlap, even for balloon expandable. In this case, for commissional alignment, you need to be with the three cusp uh, projection. Well, so but so we, do you think we about published a paper in Jack on commissional yeah. alignment with Sapien just a few months ago. Mm -hmm. And you can certainly do it. Um, this positioning strategy requires the three cusp view. But you can imagine you could position the, the C slightly differently to compensate for a, uh, a, a cusp overlap view, if you wish. But that hasn't been worked out or tested yet. So that's something for the future. But it, it, could, it could be done. So the, I think now, if you want to position in the cusp overlap view and then go to the three cusp view to check for 
um, commissioner sure. alignment. That's what I would suggest people do until we understand better. Mm -hmm. In your example, uh, the post-intervention in geography showed a perfect uh, result. Uh, but sometimes you have, uh, due to wire bias, an opening of the leaflets, which may not be related uh, to the valve expansion. How, how frequently do you need to exchange uh, the wire uh, in, in the assessment of uh, aortic regurgitation? Oh, well, well, in my center, we use an Amplatz extra stiff wire, which isn't that stiff. And so we don't find it interferes with the leaflets a lot. I think if you're using Safari, you might have more of a problem with artifactual aortic insufficiency. Is this your question? Yes, yes. Yeah, and, and even with our wire, we find if we pull the, the flex cath back further, it tends to centralize it as well. Um, you, qu you mentioned the pusher. Yes, you still need a pusher because you don't want the stent to slide back on the balloon. Now, uh, would it happen? Probably not, usually. <laughs> but yes, you still want the pusher when you cross and then pull it back. Maybe Raj, I have a question about, um, you have the possibility of adapt to the, the, the volume, it's still to adapt the volume to the, the size you want to for your implantation. Um, I think it's, 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 it's better to select immediately the size because if don't, if you think I will start by a smaller size, you will have to repeat the, the, the maneuver and we know that repeat the maneuver is a is, uh, gives, uh, increases the risk of uh, stroke, for example. So how do you do in your practice? I mean, you, you try to select immediately the optimal diameter you want for your, your device? Yes, that's correct. So we, we tend to do that. And I also, if I can, you know, to complete the conversation on the commissural alignment, as John mentioned, I, th I think your clinical person will often remind you that you have to relock. So because you're rotating the C and making it optimal, but before we go up, we tend to, we, we must relock the system so that it doesn't rotate as you're expanding. Uh, but yes, I think, uh, you know, we, you know, if you are at the, if you are at the, the problem will often come up, right? If you're at the very end of the spectrum, right? So if you are, then, where do you go? Do you go to the next size with the minimum, or do you actually go to the lower size with the, with the absolute increase in volume? And I think we've gone on both sides. John, do you have a preference, you know, when you're right in the middle? Um, Which or at the borderline? We usually like to have a bit of room to make it bigger in case there is a leak. Um, I think this being said though, we're more and more going to zero to 5% oversizing. Um, and we find that uh, with, this, with these current skirts, we don't have a lot of problems with leak. And if we do, we can always go high, bigger, but not very often do we do a second inflation, to be frank. And what about the risk of pacemaker with the X4? Is it well, the same as... It, uh... it, it, I don't think we have good data yet. It's mm. probably about the same. same. Maybe because we're better at positioning it, it'll be lower. We'll see. And what about uh, valve size? Now we have uh, 16 different uh, options. Do you need something on the extreme uh, ends uh, beyond the so, 30? So the, um, it isn't as though you have 16 boxes. <laughs> you have three boxes and a lot of choices. But the, the large valve, I think, it, uh, I think the large valve, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's 29.5 is, is the limit. That's correct, and Which, it's 757. In yeah. terms of area. So that's big. Yeah. And, and then, you know, Raj would admit probably, and so would I, that we, we go beyond what we're allowed to do frequently. Uh, with these not very, in, very big annuals. Not, not, not in not, the clinical not, trial. Not in the US. clinical trial. But <laughs> with Sapien 3, we, we, you know, there's, there's reports of people treating annuli in 800, 900 square centimeters with, oh, with yeah. sealing dependent upon the leaflets themselves. Not that that's part of this trial or recommended. And we may need it also on the mitra side, so uh, occasionally. Yeah. So thank you very much. You. I think now we move to the second part. So we'll move to the second part, which is dedicated to tricuspid regurgitation and an innovative device, which is the Evoke valve. So the, my co-moderator will be uh, Philippe Lurtz. And uh, we will, uh, first of all, have the result of the Trison 2 uh, randomized trial. Yeah, so we switch gears, but we start with um, as an introduction to remind uh, ourselves about the data of the randomized Trison 2 trial. 
the, the first randomized trial assessing a transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement system. Here you can see the valve, the evoke valve consisting of a nitinol self-expanding frame, a bovine pericardial tissue valve. It has nine anchors to allow safe and accurate positioning um, in, the, in the leaflets and tricuspid valve annulus. It comes in three different sizes and these valves, they are delivered and deployed using a system which has 28 French and that's a transfemoral approach. The randomized study had a two-to-one randomization with two patients, uh, with, with, with um, um, one group being the evoke group and the other group being um, medical therapy only. Because that device and also the study um, was granted FDA breakthrough um, designation pathway. It actually is a two-part study design with a larger cohort of 400 patients looking at heart clinical endpoints at one year. That's something we uh, are eagerly awaiting to see next year. At this point in time, we do have the pre-specified interim analysis of the first 150 patients looking both at safety and effectiveness um, up to six months. That's a quick summary of the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Obviously patients with some increased surgical risk, symptomatic, at least severe tricuspid regurgitation and um, those with very low life expectancy, very low left ventricular ejection fraction or quite markedly increased pressures um, in the pulmonary artery amongst others were exclusion criteria. For these first 150 patients, there were 30 sites enrolling these patients, both in the US and in Germany. Here you can see the baseline characteristics of the two treatment arms. Typical age for a study looking at patients with tricuspid regurgitation, about 80 years. There was certainly a female predominance um, in the cohort. All patients, um, most of these can be considered to be highly symptomatic um, with about 80% being in NYHA class 3 or 4 with a very low KCCQ score, meaning that they um, had certainly limited quality of life being severely limited by tricuspid regurgitation. A lot of comorbidities, up to 20% had ascites. So this is clearly a sick cohort of patients with also clear signs of right heart failure. In majority, it was functional tricuspid regurgitation, but there was also a significant proportion of patients with either primary or mixed etiology. In 96% of patients, the valve was implanted successfully with a device time a bit more than one hour. There were only two cases in which conversion to surgery was needed. Both cases were due to some right ventricular injury, probably due to the wire, but in both cases the valve was implanted successfully and also was left there in place working well. The primary endpoint at 30 days was the percentage composite maze and that was um, found to be 27.4% with an upper confidence bound of 36.9%. That was compared to a medical claims of patients who underwent isolated surgical tricuspid valve replacement, and it was expected to see a MACE rate of 44%. So in this trial in the EVOKE treatment group, clearly um, lower and um, in conclusion, that study and this interim analysis of 150 patients, the primary safety endpoint was met. Here is a more detailed and, um, summary of the complications and adverse events which occurred. Cardiovascular mortality, 3.2%. Severe bleeding is very often seen in patients with tricuspid regurgitation. And this is not so much related to the exercise, but um, other um, causes of bleeding. And then 15% um, of patients, um, a pacemaker implantation was necessary due to conduction dis disorders. Now we look at the results at six months. Baseline TR, very similar in the two treatment groups, but um, a very robust, very homogeneous reduction of tricuspid regurgitation in the replacement um, group with 99% um, of patients having moderate or less 
TR and 94% having mild or less MR and obviously in the control group the vast majority still having significant tricuspid regurgitation. The clinical implications of the replacement and reduction in TR was um, assessed by KCCQ score, NYHA class, and six-minute walking test. And the comparison between the two treatment groups was done by um, performing a win ratio analysis, and that came out to be 4.6. This is highly significant and indicates a clear win for the evoked treatment arm as compared to the medical arm. And this is also highlighted here, looking at the deltas of KCCQ score and six-minute walking test, clear differences and superiority in the um, device arm as compared to the medical arm. And the same holds true for NYHA class. So this is the very first randomized study with um, looking at the performance both safety and effectiveness of a transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement um, technology, the Evoke valve. This study met the primary safety endpoint and also effectiveness. It shows um, lower composite maze rates than expected, um, a very robust and marked reduction in tricuspid regurgitation, and most importantly, that also resulted in improvement in clinical status of these patients. Now, obviously, there are some differences as compared to um, TIER. Now, in Europe, we have three devices being um, um, approved. Or we have several for, for TIER. Now, we have also a replacement device. And maybe I um, transition directly into the discussion and ask um, you, Becky, whether you think that, given the fact that now we have TIER and also replacement available, is it important to compare the outcomes of tier and replacement, or is it more likely that we look at a slightly different cohort of patients who then will end up with replacement as opposed to tier? Well, I think uh, what you've shown is that uh, there, there are very different uh, patient populations in those trials. Whether or not um, we can extend the results that we saw in Tricent to um, a, a, a lower, um, you know, a, a more well population, um, I think remains to be seen. Uh, but what we know is that in the Tricent trial, it was almost 18 point improvement in their KCCQ. This is obviously a, an early look, but um, a, just an impressive impressive improvement in the way the patients feel. And remember that uh, the tri there was a study called the TriQual study, which the FDA for in the US required, looking at all devices and their outcomes. Um, and they showed that for every grade reduction in tricuspid regurgitation, you should see about a three-point increase in uh, the KCCQ. And so it just goes to support the fact that this device takes away all the tricuspid regurgitation. Um, and in doing so, the, uh, the hope is that we might also see not just patient-related outcomes, but obviously the other harder outcomes, such as uh, uh, mortality and heart failure hospitalization. But that remains to be seen, obviously. Uh, maybe it's important to mention once again that patients in the, in the um, replacement arm, obviously they had some complications, but when we then look at quality of life, apparently the reduction in TR um, um, balanced that out. Yeah. And um, when we then look at six months, patients who received the valve and had no TR, almost very little TR, they had better quality of life. Jörg, you just came in, but uh, even without listening to my talk, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you, you know the data and you know the field well enough. How important is it for you to reduce TR to mild or less? Well, looking at our tier data, I think we can very well, at least in our cohort, demonstrate that the less tier we can have, uh, the less TR we do have after an, an um, tier procedure, the better is the long-term outcome. And uh, I think this will also going to be shown with the Tricin 2 data that um, with this abolition of TR, that we probably um, will have also a beneficial impact. As Peggy just said, we are waiting for the data on the heart failure hospitalization and mortality. But looking at the in, on, on, on all data available, um, the KCCQ improvement, I think it really uh, points to the fact that we probably might going to see a significant benefit. So TR reduction 
or abolition is very important, yes. Maybe one, one last comment about the, the bleeding and anticoagulation. Obviously, all of these patients, almost all of them, they have AFib, so they, they, they come in with some, some DOAC. Um, sometimes they are then switched to warfarin after they receive the valve. Um, is that also your approach? Do you think that patients should be on warfarin or can they be kept on, on DOAC? I think this is something we don't know yet, um, to, to be very honest and clear. Um, our current practice is that we're going to keep the patients on the same medication as the patients had been before treatment. And then we're going to do a very um, um, thorough um, follow-up investigation if there is any signs of increased gradients or halt evolving over time. But then, yes, we would switch the patient to an intensified warfarin regimen, but otherwise not. Yeah. I mean, every study... In, with patients with tricuspid regurgitation has shown that they have a very high bleeding risk. Um, and as said, this is not so much um, related to the exercise, but it's just a general baseline risk of these patients for, for, for bleeding, but obviously something we um, have to deal with in the future and come up with good solutions. Okay, then, then we would move on and have a short presentation of a case, please. Um, what I'm going to show you first is a patient uh, which we treated some, some weeks ago. Um, this is an 85-year-old male patient. You see the body mass index with 18 kilograms per square meter, had some previous heart failure hospitalizations in May this year, and dyspnea on exertion with a New York Heart Class 3. Looking at the echo, which you will see in a second, uh, the cause of the, New York, uh, of the dyspnea on exertion was a severe tricuspid regurgitation measured as even torrential. As we just discussed, the patient had also a permanent atrial fibrillation. He had suffered from a stroke in 2009, had some cardiorenal syndrome with a reduced GFR and some Crohn's disease. The dry score was calculated to be six points, which correlates with a 22 predicted, 22% predicted in-hospital mortality. Looking at the right heart cath and the medication data, you see that the mean PA pressure was 22 millimeters of mercury, the wedge pressure 11. This uh, translates into an 11, transpulmonary gradient of 11. And um, there was a significant V wave, as you, uh, as you see here, with 12 millimeters of mercury, no significant pulmonary hypertension. Here's on um, 20 milligrams of teracamide and also an SGLT2 inhibitor. And the cornea angiograms showed no obstructive coronary artery disease as uh, shown in these three um, videos. This is uh, the patient presentation in, in the echo. You see uh, so good uh, or slightly reduced left ventricular function a mild MR, but you also can see on the right image in the four-chamber view that the right heart is really um, enlarged, um, and the right atrium is also very, very big. When we're looking at right ventricular function, you see a different measures. <clears throat> the Tapsi was 21 millimeter, um, the S-wave 11.5 in the strain analysis, we had some hepatic vein flow reversal, and you see also by the um, Doppler color flow, the severe torrential tricuspid regurgitation. This is then the TE um, evaluation. You see a very complex valve with a very large gap. The gap measured between 10 and um, 8 millimeters at different um, um, aspects of the valve. But you can also appreciate um, in the transgastic view that we have one moderate size anterior leaflet, but then three or even four posterior uh, scallops, um, and then also, and, and of course, the septal leaflet. And with this, I think I'm going to hand it over to Becky. Ah. Okay. <laughs> uh, you, you haven't shown uh, CT, so I'm going to skip this. Um, and just uh, go on to the to the next. Um, but uh, uh, this is uh, just uh, these are all still frames because it's the smart screen. Um, but the still frame that I took of um, of the leaflets that I that I see it 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 is indeed a very complex valve. Initially, I thought there might be two posteriors, and there might be. 
um, but there also seem to be a scalloped anterior. So extraordinarily complex. You can see that the conformation of the, uh, of the regurgitation is similar. So again, originally I thought there might be another commissure here, so it would be, um, I don't know if I can draw. Um, yeah, uh, so leaflet here, leaflet here. There might be another leaflet here and then a scalloped and, uh, septal leaflet as well. So it's possible, although the color Doppler is suggesting maybe um, just a, um, a single posterior. Becky, you mentioned already several difficulties in that valve, at least um, when it comes to when it comes yeah. to here. First is increased number of leaflets. Mm -hmm. What and then, other difficulties are there? Yeah, so yeah. the increased number of leaflets, so we developed the nomenclature uh, to describe the leaflets for communication, particularly during tear procedures. Um, but the complexity of the leaflets has been shown in a couple studies uh, to reduce the ability to get down to moderate to tricuspid regurgitation with a tear device. The other thing that we see is just the coaptation gaps. So the coaptation gaps and the complexity of the valves suggest that, again, these are gaps that are larger than seven, eight, even nine millimeters. So we were getting up to, up to 11 and, and 12 millimeters in some spots. Um, and that, again, is another predictor of not being able to get to moderate. And remember, uh, we just discussed that getting to moderate or less is going to impact outcomes, and this is mortality. Uh, so we're already thinking uh, this is not such a great idea for, for the tear device. Um, and then when you look at the three-dimensional imaging, um, this is where we thought maybe posterior is indeed just a single. This is three-dimensional, by the way, off of a transthoracic. It's a near-field valve uh, for the transthoracic echo, and therefore we're able to really reconstruct by three dimensions on transthoracic. And so this is, again, where we we thought that there was a single posterior, um, a very scalloped, you can see the different scallops of the septal leaflet here. I don't want to draw on it because um, a, 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 a small A2 and then a bigger A1, very complex, very complex valve. And then going along with that, and this again is transthoracic 3D echo, very high uh, line density and spatial resolution because um, uh, your echocardiographer, who I assume was, was Michael Nabauer, uh, was able to get us a multi-beat acquisition. And again, you see the complexity of the valve with a very large central gap. And again, very difficult for us, and this is a 3D vena contracta area that I reconstructed of over two centimeters squared. So again, outcomes for torrential shown in the trials to actually not to predict that you will have fewer patients able to get to moderate. So multiple uh, uh, suspicions um, that we are not gonna be able to use um, a tear device effectively um, in this, uh, in the patient. And then the one other thing to think about is right ventricular function, right? So uh, we know that, so if we're thinking maybe we need to be putting in a valve replacement device, these are devices that we, as, as you showed, take away all tricuspid regurgitation. And we've learned that the more tricuspid regurgitation you take away, the higher the effective afterload to that right ventricle. And you need some, comp you need the compensatory RV function in order to overcome that acute uh, effective increase in afterload. We're getting RV strains of 29 uh, uh, percent or minus 29, which is very good. It's actually uh, hyperdynamic for a, for a right ventricle. And an RV ejection fraction, which I think Jorg will show in a moving image, of 53 percent, very, very good, should have enough reserve uh, to overcome this increase in afterload. That's it. So, so, so the, the chain of thought here, uh, why don't we do tear because it's safe? Well, because the chances of bringing it down to moderate are not high enough because of the complexity of the valve and because of the gaps and also because there was color all yeah, over the place, side. which also doesn't make it very easy. That certainly biases the, um, the decision a little bit towards replacement, but then the question is how good is right ventricular function? Um, as beautifully demonstrated, the assessment of RV function was not just based on TAPC, but um, you also had a three-dimensional approach to it with a right ventricular ejection fraction and beautiful images. This is certainly the way forward. How often can you do 3D echo and get a reliable right ventricular ejection fraction in these patients? 
Well, we don't know what is reliable, of course, at the end, but um, um, in an experienced ecocardiographer, um, at least what I have seen um, in our lab is that very often in the vast majority of patients, we get a, a good 3D assessment. Echo, if, uh, Becky, if you, if you don't get um, a proper 3D assessment, do you think that it's required to do CT or MR? to assess RV function before you replace the valve? That's such a good question. Um, obviously, CT and MR are, are very effective in, in allowing us to see RV function and RV and the global function of RV ejection fraction. Um, uh, the, the question is, is, do we need it? And is it, is it the one metric that predicts outcome and, um, uh, and recoverability? And that we just don't know. So uh, we've not been... Uh, require, we require CT because we're, we obviously, if we're going to size for, uh, for annular devices or replacement devices, we need to have the CT. We don't necessarily require CMR to, uh, to get us uh, adequate volumes for ejection fraction yet. But I do think we, we're still learning about which metric of RV function will allow us to predict outcomes in, in all of these different uh, TTVIs. But I think for me, if I might jump in, um, to as, as important as RV function is also the pulmonary vascular resistance. So if we are going to starting with a very low pulmonary vascular resistance in the beginning, the probability that this RV might fail, I think, is probably very, very low. Yeah. All right, show us what, what you've done. So I'm going to start this uh, video, um, and I'm not going to talk with uh, during the pres uh, during the video because I think it's uh, I hope at least that the sound is well enough. I want to show you here the evoke valve system. This is the implant. You see that this is a valve which has nine anchors for the uh, fixation of the valve into the tricuspid annulus. You see the three. Uh, bovine leaflets of the valve. The inner diameter of this valve is 28 millimeters. This valve has already been prepared in the transcatheter system. As you see it here, this is the uh, 28 French delivery system. It has a very soft tip. The valve which we're going to use is already mounted in this capsule in, the, in, the, uh, in this part here. Then you see um, <clears throat> that this delivery system has a, a long handle with several knobs. This allows us with the white and the blue um, knobs to expand the valve and to, to um, expose the valve. And the gray um, knobs, the light gray, the dark gray knobs are for the flexion of the catheter system, while the dark black one um, <coughs> has the possibility to elongate the system so that we're getting deeper into the right ventricle or to come back if we need some more additional height. Now you see on fluoroscopy that we are already in, um, in the right age with the tip of our system. Now what we're going to do is that we're going to pull back this sheath a little bit, which allows us now to start with the flexion of the system and you see that we're already moving slowly into the right ventricle very slowly and very controlled i'm adding a little bit more flexion onto the system And now we are in a position where it's already in the right ventricle and we can now put the entire uh, delivery system into the stabilizer, which you see here. This stabilizer allows us to then do all the movements in a very controlled and secure fashion. We're going to show you now by echo where we are located with the delivery system. Um, you see the multiplanar reformation of the echo. You see that the lines are already superimposed onto the delivery system. What you can appreciate um, in the, where the marker right now is that we are in the center of the tricuspid valve. 
which is also demonstrated in the upper left and upper right image. Furthermore, you can already appreciate the distal end of the delivery system, the marker band. Maybe you can point on that as well on the echo. The green one here, this is the distal end. And now when you compare this with the fluoroscopy, what we're going to generate is now a, a capsule gap. So we're going to start with the retraction of the gap. And by fluoroscopy, you see this, that the dark gray or black ring is moving to the left, closer to the valve. This generates this capsule gap here. And now we're going to see how deep this capsule gap is located within the right ventricle. We are now going to expose the anchors. For this, I'm using this white knob again, and I'm going to retract very slowly the capsule, which you can appreciate in the fluoroscopy. And uh, now the anchors are starting to coming out, and they will flare to this 45 degree like this. And now we're going to see in more detail our position of the valve in the right ventricle. Now by echo you can see the anchors in this 45 degree position. We um, added a little bit depth so that we're get, getting a little bit more deeper into the right ventricle so that we are nicely below the leaflets but above the pul uh, papillary mu uh, muscles. At this point we cannot retract the, um, the valve into the system anymore. Um, so we're going to continue um, because we have a good position. Um, and we're going to now expose the anchors to 90 degrees. It's again uh, use of the white knob and by fluoroscopy you can appreciate that the anchors are coming further out. And we're going to stop here at a position of 90 degrees. And this will allow us now to re-evaluate again our uh, position in the right ventricle and also our position in relation to the tips of the leaflets. Now, as you can see by echo, um, with this 90 degree from um, position of the anchors, we uh, readjusted a little bit our system so that we're truly in the center of the valve. The leaflets are still above the system, above the anchors, and we will now um, continue with the exposure then we're going to flip the anchors so that um, they're facing backwards like this. And now we can evaluate the echo and see if the leaflets are all nicely on the, on the valve. Now, if you're going to focus on the echo, you're going to see the pointer in the green image on the right of the delivery system where the leaflet is uh, above the valve system. And you keep your eyes onto this position during the spin, which we're going to do in a, now, that we are going to rotate this green um, box around the center of the valve. Becky, do you? I think it's up to you now to, to dem demonstrate this again, correct? Yeah, we'll show you a couple things um, that Jörg will finalize uh, once he implants the valve. Um, but what he's, what he's shown you and what uh, is extraordinarily important for this particular device um, is to do this rotation. So he's using, uh, and this is again Michael, I think, um, is using multi-planar reconstruction um, in order to image all nine anchors. So you, you really have to image all nine. And so when you do the rotation, uh, you'll be, uh, you can go either way, uh, clockwise or counterclockwise, but you're gonna be rotating um, uh, one of the planes and uh, York says that they like to end up watching one side of one of the images, which is what we also do. Um, and so it's gonna be, you know, starting over here and then you're gonna rotate around until you see all nine anchors. And the important thing is that what you're looking for is for the tips of the, uh, you, you want to identify all nine, but you want to confirm 
the coaxiality by uh, having the tips of the leaflets roughly in uh, the same position below the annulus, um, and the leaflets coming over the uh, the top of the anchor tips. So that means that you'll you'll be in the correct position. And so then, uh, so once you you've ensured that um, that you've got uh, the the leaflets. Um, then, uh, you know, he's already shown you a couple of other things. One, that there's actually three different times in which we're looking for uh, the leaflet rotation. Uh, one was when he was at 90 degrees. This, this is obviously a picture when he's already flipped the anchors. But at 90, um, and you probably did it uh, and, and, and cut it out uh, for, the, for the tape, but at 90 degrees, when anchors are out at 90, we will do a rotation to make sure that we're at the correct height. So we've learned from experience that if you're too low, you may get caught in cordy, um, or you may uh, not be above the papillae muscle tips. Um, and then uh, if you're too high, once the anchors flip, they will flip up higher, and therefore you'll miss uh, the annulus and the leaflets. And so we do it at not only here, but also uh, as, as Jorg has done, um, in addition at the 90 degrees. So once it's already flipped, uh, again, we're confirming coaxiality, leaflet capture, height to the annulus. And you can see that I've drawn the green and the red planes from the multiplanar reconstruction. And this is where we'll, we'll grab one of the planes and rotate. So this is green plane here, now green, I've just taken some screenshots, green plane here, green plane here, he's going around systematically in order to see the leaflets coming over the top of, of, the, of the device. So leaflet over the top, here's the leaflet again over the top, leaflet again over the top, and this is the most important thing uh, that, that we have. Now I'm going to try a different method here of of getting to the next page. I don't know if this will work, but we'll try. Okay. Um, okay, so then um, uh, the additional clues that we actually saw was that uh, the level of the blue plane, the blue plane, which is your short axis plane, was placed just at the anchor which would allow you to also see leaflets. And you'll see this on the live image. It also allows you to see the leaflets on the inside of all the anchors. So that's your double check. You have restriction of leaflet motion. Uh, you have the short axis view already in the blue plane. And by seeing the leaflets on the inside, you, you've double checked that, you've, that, you've, that you're in the right position. Okay, I think that's probably, yeah. So uh, Jorg will show this in the end, so I don't want to give it away. <laughs> but as, he's, uh, as he uh, ends up expanding, uh, you'll see there's also a double check again about uh, location. Okay. I think it's important to realize that we did this this um, 360 degree spin at at various levels during the procedure, and as you just mentioned, it has been cut out so that we keep the length of the uh, video rather short. I just erased it with my hand. So I think I'm going to continue. Let's see if I. This is what we have seen. You keep your eyes onto this position during the spin, which we're going to do in yes. a, now. That we are going to rotate the screen um, box around the center of the valve. And now you're going to start rotating, please the spin, and now we're going to focus on each of those anchors. So this is an anchor in, in the antoreceptor commissure. We're going to rotate to the next anchor, which is in the sh behind the shadow. Here again, the leaflet is above the anchor, and now we continue to the third anchor. Again, it's, the leaflet is falling nicely from above onto the valve system, and we're going to continue um, until we are back to the home view, which is in, in the next 180 degrees. Now here we are in the posterior view. We're getting to the posterior septal commissure. And now if we spin further, we see the septal image. And in all those images, the leaflets are well above the tricuspid valve. Um, so this allows us now to further expand the valve which I'm going to do right now. Um, and you see this again with the white knob. I'm going to expose the valve a little bit further. The anchors are getting a little bit bigger. 
and now we're going to stop here and do another re-evaluation um, of our valve exposure. Now that we have confirmed our position again in another spin, we're going to now expand the valve further. Um, and I do this again with the white knob and you see by fluoroscopy how the valve is getting bigger and bigger. And we are going to go now fully back with the capsule behind this band here. And this is now the position where our white knob is um, is out of function for the future. Uh, we're going to stay on this echo image and do another re-evaluation because uh, the next step will then focus on the valve expansion with the blue knob. Now that we have um, checked our position and uh, did some minor adjustments, we're going to continue with the valve expansion. Now, as I said before, the white knob is already maxed out. We cannot use the outer capsule, um, but now we're going to move, uh, continue with the inner capsule, which is the blue knob. And as you can see now by fluoroscopy, I'm pulling back this inner capsule, which expands the valve a little bit further. Now you see how it is getting bigger and we're going to stop here. Then in the next step, we do the final release. Now for this final release, I'm going to now um, retract the, the inner capsule further and we're going to watch this by fluoroscopy. As you see now, this is expanding further and now it's jumping free and stays stable as anticipated. I'm going to do a little angiogram. We have no conduction disturbances. This patient still has a heart rate of 100. Now, finally, also with the primary flex. And for this, I'm going to take out the handle out of the uh, delivery system. Now I'm going to remove the other. And now we're going to pull back the wire into the right atrium. Now it's in the right atrium. And now we need to bring back the capsule first. The inner capsule again, as you see it advancing. And then the now the capsule is completely closed again. And we can further retract now the system out of the right atrium. Now, if we have a look by echo of our implant result. Now, this is the, the final result here. This is the um, evoke valve with the leaflets here. This is the antiraceptal commissure. Here you can see the inflow in the valve. There's a tiny little uh, uh, regurgitation in the antiraceptal triangle. This is quite common. Um, so this looks very good. If we look on the gradient through this valve, we have a gradient mean of one millimeter of mercury. This is also a very good um, result. And this is the 3D view of the valve in the final position. Down here is the aortic valve for five o'clock, just for your uh, orientation. And this is the final um, color view with the inflow through the center of the evoke valve. And there's no regurgitation, which I think is really a beautiful result. And that's it. <laughs> Fantastic result. I have a couple of uh, quick questions requiring short answers. You didn't pace. Why didn't you do that? Well, pacing is not required. It's so very well controlled. Um, uh, there is no need for pacing. Nine anchors, can you miss out on one or two? Yes, you can. Uh, sometimes you, um, if you have an anchor which is lying in the, um, in the commissure, you miss, of course, uh, the leaflets, but you should not uh, miss more than two or, th two or three because that might be 
associated with, okay. with some instability. Lucas, can I ask you something about post-operative care? How long do you keep those patients on intensive care or monitoring? Patients are basically on our ICU for one or two days um, just to monitor heart rhythm. Then they go to the normal ward and are quickly discharged. Okay. And one last question. RV function, did it change? Did it go down? Did it get better? Um, the RV function dropped a little bit. So from this hyperdynamic state, it get to the more or less normal RV function. But we haven't seen the patient um, for follow-up yet. So it's, uh, he's coming probably very soon. And then we have a better understanding. Okay. Good. Thank you. So we're coming to the, to the end of the session. We had a very beautiful uh, and impressive demonstration of uh, two uh, very innov innovative uh, technology. The X4 for uh, aortic stenosis. Uh, the X4 is under clinical investigation in the US and Canada, as was explained by John Webb. And of course, we are looking forward to have this device in uh, Europe with this demonstration of uh, this, uh, all these advantages in comparison to the previous devices. And uh, the second one, the Evoke, the new valve for tricuspid regurgitation, which uh, got the C mark very recently. So again, it's a very uh, important device device for this uh, amount of patients with uh, severe regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitations. So both uh, very impressive devices to improve the outcome of our patients. So I want to thank the speakers, the discussants, my two co-moderators, the audience for having stayed so, so long today. So I wish you a very nice uh, evening and see you tomorrow.